This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston and our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Today we're going to continue in the book of Philippians. So if you uh, want to follow along, we'll be in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. So you can go ahead and flip there if you would like. Um, a couple of things. If you want to officially connect to the church um, and you're just now joining us, you didn't hear me say it earlier, you want to fill out that connect card and get connected with us this week. This week. If um, you have a response to the message in any way, you want prayer or you'd like to know more about some of the things in the message, that Connect card, that digital Connect card is the way you're going to do that. There's one up at the top, and our host will be dropping one in the chat, too, that you can click. So I encourage you to, uh, to uh, click that and participate. So thank you for being with us again today, especially if you're a guest. We're glad that you are here. Today we're going to look at um, two humble servants that the Lord uses in incredible ways to minister to people. And we're going to see how the Lord can use us as humble servants to minister to the world around us. Now, um, here in the U.S., the everyday life of people in the United States, we work through the imperial system of measurement. By all accounts, it is an inferior system, especially since uh, John Broccanelli reminds me of that quite often. Every time I tell him the temperature, he's like, can you tell me that in metric? Or uh, I'm always like, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, he, it, it's, it, by all accounts, it is inferior. And honestly, it really doesn't make a ton of sense if you really think about it. There are eight ounces in, let me get this right, there are eight ounces in a cup and 16 cups to a gallon. And why there are those things, I cannot tell you why that is. I just know that that is how I was taught and that is what I've learned. Um, it, you, it works in my everyday life that I can measure things kind of visually and understand weight and stuff and it's just what I've gotten used to but it's not necessarily the best way. Back in 1889, several countries around the world got together and actually signed a treaty to standardize uh, measurement across the world. This treaty was called the Treaty of the Meter. What a name, right? Treaty of the Meter. So one of the countries that signed uh, this treaty was, you guessed it, the United States of America. It's like, why don't we run on the metric system? Fun fact, and you can tell this to everybody you know, we technically do run on the met metric system. Did you know that uh, the gallon is, uh, excuse me, the pound is actually um, uh, backed up by the metric system. So when they're trying to describe what a, what a pound of weight is, this is what they say. It is 0.4535 kilograms. That's exactly what a pound is. So we secretly run on the metric system. Back in Maryland, there is a, uh, there is a hunk of metal and that hunk of metal is the, uh, what was called the prototype standard for the kilogram. This is a picture of it that you see on the screen right now. This uh, it was how they measured what a kilogram was. And the problem with it, though, was that the, the measurement changed every once in a while because the mass was changing just a fraction. It really annoyed the scientists out there that a kilogram was not always the exact same thing. So in order to fix that, they came up with a different way. They came up with something to do with Planck's constant, and I'm not a, I don't really know what I'm talking about once I get to this point, but they made up an equation that says exactly what a kilogram is without ever changing, and this is the equation. That equation is way more exact than the hunk of metal that sits in Maryland and one that sits in France and several that sit all around the world still, and that is the definition of a kilogram. It's a standard of measurement, and it's exact. So even though it's a lot more abstract than a cylinder, it is uh, more exact than a cylinder. And so we all need standards in our life. If you're going to weigh something, you're going to want there to be a standard so you know that what you're weighing is going to be the same every single time. We need standards. So whatever your job is, whether you're um, flipping hamburgers or you're designing the next iPhone, there is a standard for your job, something that you must achieve, uh, something that gives consistency, expectations, and it, it gives a bar for us to reach up to. 
So for a chapter and a half, the Apostle Paul has unpacked what the standard for the Christian life is. As a follower of Christ, that standard has a name. It's right in our name. As we say Christians, we are little Christ. The standard for us is Jesus Christ. So if we stick with the analogy of the uh, kilogram, that Jesus is more like the equation. He is the perfect standard for which we are to live. But the problem with that is we often look at Jesus when we say things like, oh, well, you know, I'll never be able to reach that. I'll never be able to get to there. I'm not God. And if you say that, you're very observant. Um, You're not. We're not going to be able to reach that. But what the Apostle Paul does here is he gives us another standard. He gives us two people today, two men who were faithful in their work for the Lord, which they're not the equation, but they're like the hunk of metal. It's not perfect, but they really, really reflect what is true and right and what a Christian should live like. And so now these two men make it where we have no excuse for the way we live because Paul points to them and says, everything you've heard about Christ, these men are living it out in their daily life. So look to them. And what we're going to see about them is both of these examples that Paul gives is that their faithfulness didn't come from any one big act. There's nothing massive that they did, but it came from several faithful acts every single day, them living out their lives in faithfulness. There's this great quote by Fred Craddock. Um, and, and I just love how he explains it. He's a pastor. Uh, he, he's passed away now, but he's a pastor and a theologian and a professor was. Um, This is what he said. To give my life for Christ appears glorious. To pour myself out for others. To pay the ultimate price for martyrdom. I'll do it. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory. We think we can give our all to the... We think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a thousand dollar bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord. I am giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that he sends us to the bank and has us cash the $1,000 in for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents there. Listening to the neighbor's kids' trouble instead of saying, get lost. Go to a committee meeting. Give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. Usually, giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done in all the little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. And with that, let's look at our scripture today of these two Christian standards who give their lives one quarter at a time. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. Now, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you as soon, uh, to you soon that I too may be encouraged by news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in gospel ministry like a son with a father. Therefore, I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will also come soon. But I consider it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need, since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am very eager to send him, so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and hold people like him in honor, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today as we look into your word and discover what you have for us today, I pray that we would take this word and not just hear it, but we would be doers of the word. Move it into our hearts and move it out of our hands and our feet that we could act this out. 
And as we see the examples of these two faithful men, Lord, may we then take them and, and strive to be like them. Strive to uh, emulate Christ, uh, emulate them as they emulated Christ. Follow them as they follow Christ. Lord, I pray that that would be our desire today. Speak to this word to us today, Lord. And when you speak to us, may we obey. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first standard we're going to look at is Timothy. Timothy. We see that many of us have heard of a, um, uh, a person that, that is a soulmate. Somebody says, oh, I found my soulmate. See, we usually think of that idea as romantic. And maybe some of you are anxious to get back to church because you're anxious to find your soulmate because you're looking in church. And ladies, let me just tell you, uh, whatever guy picks up the most chairs at one time, that should be your soulmate. And guys, that should be a clue to you. You know, be lifting and stuff so you can be picking up those chairs. That's what they're going to be looking for. Um, uh, but Paul has a soulmate and is not romantic at all. He says, he says here in the Greek, it means that they are one mind, one spirit. They are mated in their mind and their spirit. They are soulmates. They are like-minded. And this is what Christ says is his goal in Philippians 3.10. 3, what is their goal? He says, my goal is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That was Paul's goal. And he says, that is also Timothy's goal. And they are like-minded in this. So both Paul and Timothy are soulmates and Christ-centered in their pursuits. And they desire to follow Christ wherever he leads. If he leads them to death, they'll follow him there. If he leads them to prison, they'll follow Christ there. If he leads them back to Philippi, they will follow Christ there. They're going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. And Paul here sees what he's going through in prison. And as he, as he has followed Christ into prison, he sees that even the suffering and death that he may be going through is going to allow him to experience Christ in ways that he would never experience him otherwise. And so Paul and Timothy's goal is to know Christ more and to push forward the gospel of Christ, no matter what it is. See, in the same way in our Christian walk, that should be our goal. We should desire to follow Christ wherever he is. We should be a Christ-centered person, you should, and we should be a Christ-centered people as the church. We're living in a world where there's trial after trial, and it seems like everything's just stacked on top of each other and getting harder and harder. But when Christ is the center of our lives, we don't have to fear our circumstances because we know that whatever we're going through, that we are learning more about Christ and who he is and living uh, uh, our life out to experience and know Christ on a deeper level because we are Christ-centered. That Even in the midst of that, we can enjoy or rejoice, maybe I should say, as Paul says, we can rejoice in pain. Romans 5, 3 through 4 says this. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. You see, we can rejoice because ultimately whatever we're going through, whatever is happening is creating a deeper longing in us for Christ and to know him better and have our knowledge of Christ increase. And then, now out of Timothy's Christ-centered life comes a Christ-centered perspective on life and on relationships. And he begins to embody the Christ-centered humility that the Apostle Paul talked about last week as we read his Christ poem earlier in uh, uh, um, Philippians. And Timothy is humble. He's humble. Look at what he says in verse 20. Paul says this, For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. It seems that Paul knows that there's a lot of people out there who even in the ministry aren't serving the interest of Christ, but they're serving their own interests. Now you can't imagine that ever happening inside the church that someone would actually be serving their own interests. Except we see it all the time, right? <laughs> Happens all the time. That rather than serving Christ, people use the church as a tool to serve their interests and their agenda. But here with Timothy, we have a man who consistently considers others more important than himself. And he goes and he serves Paul 
And in serving Paul, he serves Christ. And he serves the church. These online services have been really interesting and they've been the production of a lot of people. Last night, um, you guys, many of you know Jared and many of you know John. John was up here singing earlier. Jared isn't up on the screen today, but we stayed till um, we stayed for a good 12 hours last night making sure all this could happen. And we finally figured it out after a bunch of things went wrong. It all kind of came together. Praise God. There's a lot of people that have made this happen. You know, shout out to uh, Pastor Shane and Chloe over at Mosaic Brookline who switched the cameras and listened to both Pastor Jan's sermon and my sermon every single week back to back. Sat there for like two hours as we pontificated for forever. Um, so, you know, shout out to them. There's one person here that you've probably never met, you don't know a whole bunch about too, that I want to bring up to you. It's, it's my brother, Ben. Now, he's sort of a tech wizard. Um, and every time I have a tech problem, I, I call him. And I say, hey, can you help me with this? So the, one of the reasons that we've had worship services online is because he helped us. Um, he helped me when my computer ran out of hard drive space. He made me a little hard drive that I could plug in and, and do all the work I needed to do. A very fast hard drive that allowed me to stream off of it and all this stuff. And then when I said to him, we're having this issue, we need, to, um, we need to stream our services. Can you help me with that? He went and he did all the research and he put together a computer. He built the computer that this service is streaming off right now. Now, he has not asked me to say this. And he told me not to pay him money, even though he deserved to get paid for it. You know, I offered it. He's like, no, I don't want that kind of thing because he's not in it for that. He's in it to serve and love you. And he recognizes that he can do it in the ways that God has gifted him. See, often genuine humble service looks like using the skills and knowledge that God has given us for the benefit of others, whatever those may be. God can use them, whatever they are. So what kind of skills has God given you? And how can you use your skills to care for other people today? Think about that. Now, Paul trusts Timothy because Timothy has consistently shown himself to be trustworthy. He has proven character. He is proven. He is battle tested. This is what he says. He says in verse 22, he says, you, kn you know his proven character. See, Paul had faith in Timothy to go into these different churches and troubleshoot what was, ever, what was going wrong. He did it to the Thessalonians. He did it to the uh, Corinthians. He sent him out to go troubleshoot. And so he goes and he's utilized by God and he shows up and he works. So you can prove yourself not by being the most talented, not by being the one that's the wealthiest or being the person that's the best, but you can prove your faithfulness to God by just showing up and doing the work. We often think, oh, it's for the talented people, it's for the wealthy people, all these things. But no, God can use you just by showing up. So show up and get to work. However you can help, give your all in that. Timothy was always showing up wherever God called him and he was working with integrity for the benefit of others. I'm sure that Timothy heard this passage or something like this from Paul often as they traveled together. This is what Paul says in Colossians 3, 23. He says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. He was proven. And now Paul closes his example of Timothy with a really beautiful statement. He calls Timothy his son. Timothy was not Paul's genetic son, but in a spiritual sense, he was totally Paul's son. And this isn't the only time that Paul actually calls Timothy his son. He does it several times throughout his letters. You know, Paul didn't have any sons of his own that, he, uh, that we know of, at least, um, but he had a spiritual son, and it was Timothy. Back in that day, the role of sonship was even greater uh, than it is today, the, particularly with the firstborn son, which this would be kind of like Paul's firstborn son. And he, he, the son was expected to follow in the father's footsteps. And that's what's going on here with Timothy. Paul is saying, is he saying, this is my son? The Philippian church probably would have heard that this is the protege of Paul, his apprentice going forward. And as a father sends out his son, so Paul sends out with, with um, a gospel oddly pride, he sends him out to say, this is my son. He has deep affection for him as Timothy carries out the work of Paul. Every Christian needs someone that they're discipling, like Paul was discipling Timothy. 
But also every Christian needs to be discipled by someone like Timothy discipled Paul. We need someone who is, um, we're someone's spiritual son or daughter, and we have a spiritual son or daughter. You need to be under the apprenticeship of a more mature believer, and we need to be apprenticing less mature believers. In fact, this is the last statement of Jesus before he left earth, the Great Commission. Here it is, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. I'm going to pull out a couple of sections here just to look at. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples. Make disciples. It doesn't say converts there. It's good to make converts. People that convert to the faith. It says make disciples. And then it says this, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. We are to be making disciples. What was going on with Timothy and Paul is to be the act of all our hearts. Jesus is saying to his disciples, as I have done to you, do to others. As I have discipled you, disciple others. Are you in a relationship like that now? Who can you call a spiritual father or mother in your life? Who can you call a spiritual son or daughter in your life? Who are you discipling and who is discipling you? Now, if you can't answer that question in a split second, you can't think of someone that comes to mind or you really have to try hard, it probably means that you have some work to do in this area. So what I encourage you to do is find someone that you can disciple. Find someone that can be brought up in the faith by you and find someone to be brought up in the faith by. Who are you following as they follow Christ? Now, if you want some help with that, that Connect card again. We'll connect you into a community group. We have these new things called D groups that we're just now uh, starting. If you want to be a part of one, uh, get in it. That D stands for disciple. It's discipleship group. And we get together and we, uh, we uh, work on our faith with each other and help build each other and spur each, on, uh, spur each other on in the faith. So that's Timothy. Let's, look on, let's move on to the next st- standard of Christ-like service and humility. Because in Paul's situation, he couldn't send Timothy yet. He wanted to find out what was uh, happening with his prison sentence and you know, whether he's going to be executed or not. He wanted to f- get all that information and he's going to send Timothy ahead with it. Um, the next person, though, is Epaphroditus. What a name, right? Epaphroditus. I love it. The first thing Paul says about him is he says, this person is family. He calls him his brother. It's a different type of relationship from, um, from Timothy. See, E, I'm going to call him that several times, Epaphroditus, and you can call him that this week when you're in community group reading off his name. You can just call him E if you want. So um, E um, is not raised by Paul as a spiritual son, but he is continuing uh, to do uh, work next to Paul. And Paul has a great deal of love and affection for him. See, when Paul was fearful that E might die, he says that it would be sorrow upon sorrow in my heart if he was to, um, if he was to die. And this is kind of a side real quick, but I want you to notice that this book is all about joy. We've talked about that quite often, and yet here Paul has sorrow. So I think for someone today, know that in Christ you can have joy even in a sorrowful, sorrowful moment. Just remember that. That was, just came to mind, so maybe somebody needed that today. I'm not sure. So Paul was fearful that he might die because... He had called him brother. They were like really close brothers. They probably did things like call each other broski or brotato or ebrophroditus. I don't know about that last one, but uh, uh, I'm getting the sign. Don't say that anymore. Um, anyway, so uh, he, he says, he sends him back to Philippi. To, and he's, after coming to Paul in prison, the reason he came is he delivered financial gifts to Paul, but then he took care of Paul while in prison. He probably went shopping for Paul to get him food because Paul wasn't uh, provided food uh, by the Roman government. He had to be cared for, and that's what the church is doing. And Epaphroditus is going out and daily caring for Paul. He has volunteered to basically be a prisoner next to Paul for Paul's sake and for the sake of the gospel. See, again, in Epaphroditus, we see a Christian life that's paid out in pocket change, but not in $1,000 bills, small actions at a time. So who can you come alongside and who can you serve in ways that each action may not be massive and on its own, but in the accumulative effect of those actions, it will work out powerfully in the other person's life as you care for their needs above your own. What can you do to be that random person that shows up with some money 
to help feed you, but then becomes a brother. Think about that. He just shows up and he becomes Paul's brother during this time. Next, though, we see that Paul considers Epaphroditus his colleague. See, the Christian life is also a life of working side by side with each other. We're on, we talked about this last week, but we're on uh, the same mission, but we have different tasks and we have different skills. Was Epaphroditus going to be the best theologian that the church had ever known? No, he wasn't. That was the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was the best theologian the church has ever known. Epaphroditus was a mail deliverer. But I want you to think about this. If Epaphroditus would not have delivered that uh, letter to the Philippian church, one, the Philippian church wouldn't have been able to uh, realize the church that Christ wanted them to be. But two, we wouldn't have this if Epaphroditus wasn't willing to follow through as Paul sends him back to the Philippian church with the letter. So whether you're a theologian or a caretaker, you are important in the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul gives this awesome um, illustration where he says that for the church to complete its mission, every person is a different part of the body. This is what he says. For just as the body is one and has many parts and all parts of that body through many are one body, so also is Christ. In other words, some of us are hands some of us are eyes, some of us are noses, some of us are earlobes. <laughs> and you're like, man, I kind of feel like the earlobe. Um, but you know what? Paul says that every single person, every single part of the body of Christ is important. Sometimes we think that the pastor is the sole minister of the church, and I am a minister of this church, but every Christian is a minister according to the scriptures. That we are all to be caring and serving and sharing. In fact, I would go as far to say that you were saved in order to minister. See, Christ saved you for that. A Christian that isn't serving Christ is actually a contradiction. How are you serving today? God left us on earth for a reason, and that reason is to continue to serve him faithfully along other, alongside other believers. So how are you serving? Now, Paul moves past just a peacetime relationship of colleagues, and he moves on to a wartime type relationship. He calls uh, Epaphroditus, he calls him a soldier. That He's a warrior next to Paul. I've said it a thousand times before, but the Christian life is a battle against spiritual forces of darkness. We're going to read this again. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, out of the New Living Translation. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, as his church, we don't go to war on our own, but we go to war against the forces of darkness, his brothers and sisters. We suit up and go to battle with each other. I remember a few years ago, I was going through a difficult battle just inside the church. And during that time, I could have moved away from relationships and isolated myself, but I didn't. And I had brothers and sisters that came around me and helped me through it. And for that, I'm grateful that we were fighting side by side against the forces of darkness. Now, you might fight a spiritual battle on your own, but you, 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 you can't, excuse me, you can't fight a spiritual battle on your own. You're never meant to do that. You were meant to have someone like Epaphroditus in your life that would be a warrior alongside of you. So who is fighting that spiritual battle next to you? Next, Paul calls Epaphroditus a messenger. See, back in Paul's day, there was no reps. There was no Roman Empire postal service. If you, wanted to get a, um, if you wanted to get a letter to somebody, you actually had to send the letter through someone, and that's what Epaphroditus does. He is Paul's courier, and he got that letter back to Philippi. See, if he had given up, we would never have the powerful letter that we have today that is uh, one of my favorite letters by Paul in the entire canon of Scripture. See, as... E Epaphroditus was entrusted with this message. All of us have been entrusted with a message. We are messengers. We are couriers for the gospel of Christ, just as he was. And yes, he had, a, uh, he had a, uh, some sort of scroll probably in his hand and delivered it to the church in Philippi. We have the gospel in our hearts and we have the word of God in our hands that we deliver to the culture and the world around us. We have to be faithful with that and not withholding it. So now... We've looked at the standard for 
what it is to be a, um, a follower of Christ, like Timothy and Epaphroditus. And it's not like they were doing super spectacular things. They were just being faithful wherever God led. And actually, some of their work can seem a bit mundane. We don't think of being a mailman as a particularly exciting job. It's an essential job. It's not particularly exciting. But here, that's what they're doing. They're just being faithful with whatever God gives them. And this is Paul's perspective on, I think, both uh, Epaphroditus and Timothy. This is what he says in verse 29. Therefore, welcome him, that is Epaphroditus, in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor. And I think that like him includes Timothy. People like him in honor. That he is finally celebrated. He is honored. Why would you celebrate the mundane work of Epaphroditus? Because his everyday faithfulness to the cause of Christ, he was emulated in that he was emulating the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul ends this section with a line that very much reflects the center of his Christ poem just a few verses earlier that we went through last week. Let me read that to you. I want to remind you of it. In verse 8 of Philippians 2, he says, He, that being Christ, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I want you to hear how Paul describes Epaphroditus. He says, Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. That Epaphroditus coming close to death means that he was like roommates with death. That's kind of the imagery. It's a word picture that Paul is painting here. He was roommates with death in order that um, Christ could be glorified and Christ's work would be done. The work of Christ, as Paul says. And that is the type of Christian life that is to be honored, both in Epaphroditus, in Timothy, and in our lives. So how are you living out your life for the cause of Christ? Is it something that you think about often? Or is it not even on the radar for you? Not, you don't even consider how you're living out your life. Or are you not even considering how you, what will happen? Will you be honored in heaven? Because honestly, the honor that Epaphroditus was receiving from Paul was just a dim reflection of the honor that was going to come to him in heaven as uh, later in his life. So are you even considering that in your life? You know, the goal of the Christian life is not to be a good Christian. It's not to be uh, just a person that reads through the Bible more than anyone else or memorizes the most Bible verses. It's not even to be the person that gets a star for attending church the most. It's not, it's, it's not even about being a good witness and being the best evangelist, quote unquote. Those goals are too small. So your main goal will include those things and will include more than those things, but they are not the reason that you honor Christ in your life. You honor Christ in your life. Um, the true honor that comes to you is when the goal of your life is to pour yourself out as a sacrifice on the altar of your life. Drip by drip and faithful day after faithful day. Like quarters, paying out quarters in your Christian life for the glory of God and the honor of Christ. Today we're in a cultural moment where once again we've seen the horror of black men and women killed at the hands of those that were meant to serve and protect. And it really, it hurts our hearts to see that. There's something of a betrayal in that. And so it's got us thinking more again about racism and, and it's prejudice and, and also how we can make a difference. So let me say that if you were able to attend one of the protests, that's awesome. Um, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to peacefully protest. Um, it's, it's an honor that's been given to us in our uh, nation that we can even do something like that and tell our government officials that your laws are unjust, which is essentially what we're doing in a process. So if you're able to do that, that's, that's wonderful. But another thing that you can do is you can vote for people that are going to, um, that will uh, uh, commit to the flourishing of the black community. Those that will uh, commit to the flourishing of all people. But often, I, we've probably seen this before, is that until black lives matter, all lives don't matter. 
And so today we can say that black lives matter because black lives matter. I think that is something as a Christian we should be able to agree on. So we should not just have a flash in the pan of what it is to uh, do the protests and everything, but this should be a lifestyle of paying out quarter by quarter. This is just an example. This goes through all life and all kinds of different things, but in this example, quarter by quarter, being faithful day by day and faithfully loving and serving. So let me encourage you. It's great to protest, but you need to think of ways that you can serve day by day going forward. This isn't just one thing that happens. Now I'm going to speak for just a second. And this is no condemnation. I just want to kind of help you think a little bit. And maybe it'll spur you on to think about the way you live your life and the way I live my life. These are things that I've started to come to grips with in my, my own heart. Now, we can often move into a neighborhood that is predominantly um, not our uh, color. We can move into a neighborhood that is a different um, Uh, culture of people. And when we move into that neighborhood, what often happens is we want the little bit cheaper rent that we get in there, but we still want the amenities found in better neighborhoods, quote unquote. And so what we do is we leave our neighborhood and we go to other neighborhoods and do our shopping. We uh, go to restaurants in other neighborhoods and we go to grocery stores in other neighborhoods and we go to barbers and beauty salons in other neighborhoods, but we still live here. And what ends up happening is the businesses here don't flourish like they should because we aren't serving and caring and incarnating ourselves in our neighborhood. Now, the example is just actually not very far from me right here. There's a Whole Foods right here in Jamaica Plain. That Whole Foods used to be a Latino grocery store. As um, uh, 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 the white folks started to move in. They started living here to get cheaper rent, but they, stepped, they kept traveling out to Whole Foods to buy their groceries. And eventually the Latino grocery store shut down. And when Whole Foods did a little market research, they realized that there's a lot of white people in Jamaica Plain traveling out to Whole Foods. Why don't we put a Whole Foods in the middle of Jamaica Plain? And so that Latino grocery store that had to move out, closed down, Whole Foods took over. You know what? Whole Foods is fine. I, I really don't have a problem with Whole Foods necessarily. Uh, But most of my problem is in my own heart. God has put you in this neighborhood for a reason. He's put you here, whatever neighborhood you're in, whether you live in Jamaica Plain or you live in a different neighborhood all uh, all around Boston, God has put you there for a reason, to live and incarnate the gospel inside that neighborhood. And that means just a quarter at a time serving those around you, whatever color, whatever um, uh, culture, whatever kind of tradition or background they come from, you are to live in the neighborhood where God has put you because that is the place where you can have the most gospel influence. So I want to encourage you as an act of living out this caring for others more than ourselves, just live in your neighborhood. Like I said, this is an example. This isn't the be all end all, but it is something that we should think about in how we live out our day to day life. So with that, I want to remind you of Christ who came to earth and incarnated himself among us, which means he took on flesh for our sake, cared for us, humbled himself, as we read last week, humbled himself to be a servant, and not just a servant, but dying on a cross in our place. He gave everything for you, and he gave everything for me. He died on the cross that you deserved. He died your death for you, and through that offers life to you today. What I want to encourage you today is if you want to receive um, the salvation that comes from Christ on the cross, the scriptures tell us that you repent and believe. Repent is to follow, is to turn from the way you're going and follow Christ in all his ways. You, you become like Epaphroditus and Timothy, following out the way of Christ and then believe. Believe that on the cross, he truly died for your sins. He rose from the dead and it says you will be saved. It is living in the hope of the gospel because you can't do this on your own. You'll never be good enough. There's not enough good things that you can do. You can't march in enough protests and you can't shop in 
enough good places in order to earn your way to heaven. It is only through Christ that we do that. But as in when Christ comes into our life and the Holy Spirit is working through our hearts, we begin living out the gospel in our neighborhood in powerful ways. And that's what I want for you. I want you to receive Christ into your life and have him change and transform you. If that's something you would like to do today, our host is going to drop a little link there. It says, raise your hand, but um, all you have to do is click that and you'll go to prayer with them. And they just want to pray for you today. If you're not comfortable with that, you can fill out the connect card and we'll get back with you this week. But that's the best way that you can respond to us. What I want to do is I want to close us out in prayer. And I want you to really consider how you can be a Christian in your neighborhood, quarter by quarter, living out the gospel. Would you pray with us in Jesus' name? Heavenly Father, today we come to you knowing, God, that we live in a difficult time. It often, as Paul says, seems like sorrow upon sorrow. Lord, I pray that you would help us to find joy in you even in the midst of sorrow. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live out this gospel, whatever we're going through, day by day, quarter by quarter. Lord, for, for those of us in, that are listening here, it's going to be a little different what that's going to be. But Lord, I pray for your guidance in that. And may you be glorified in how we live our lives. Lord, that we wouldn't just be flash in the pan Christians or bandwagon uh, justice seekers, God, but we would be those that seek the justice uh, of God every single day. May we live out the gospel. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.